The topic uh, today is the polemic against the idols in Isaiah 44, verses 9 to 20. God is often referred to as summum bonum, the highest good. He is the one beyond which there is nothing and no one better, none greater. The concept was first introduced by the Roman philosopher Cicero in De Finibus et Molorum. Thomas Aquinas appropriated the term into his Christian philosophical theology in his commentary on Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics. It was also taken up by Immanuel Kant in Critique of Pure Reason in his attempt to provide a reasonable argument for the existence of God. However, there is an inherent problem with describing God as summum bonum. To use this term is to place God on a continuum at the end of which he is to be found. It also, perhaps, inadvertently places the category of the good over God. Isaiah's preaching about God rejects all attempts to compare God with anything or anyone. The question is asked repeatedly, to whom then will you liken God or what likeness compare with him? 4018. To whom then will you compare me, that I should be like him, says the Holy One, 4025. To whom will you liken me, and make me equal, and compare me, that I may be alike, 46.5. In 44.7, Yahweh again asks, who is like me? There is none, because God is sui generis. God is not summum bonum. God is rather ipsum esse subsistens a phrase used by Aquinas as well in his Summa Theologicae. It is not simply that God exists, nor is it that God is ens summum, the highest being. It is he and he alone is his own existence. Nothing can be the cause of God, although he is the cause of all that is or could be. Everything else has been brought into existence from non-existence, from not being, hence creatio ex nihilo. God is a self-subsistence being. Indeed, he is the sheer act of being. He is outside of, without, and above all categories. It is clear that God exists, but what he is in essence and nature is unknown and beyond all understanding. Thus says John of Damascus. With these words, uh, excuse me, through Isaiah, God states, Thus says Yahweh, the God of Israel, and his Redeemer, his Goel, Yahweh Sabaoth, I the first and I the last, besides me there is no God who is like me. Let him proclaim, let him declare, and set it before me. From whom have I appointed an ancient people? Let them declare what is to come and what will happen. Do not panic, do not be afraid. Have I not told you from of old and declared it, and you are my wit witnesses? Is there a God besides me? There is no rock, I know not any. 44, 6 through 8. With these words, Isaiah leads into his polemic against idols. And my translation. All those who form idols are disordered. The word there is tohu. And the things that they take, they take pleasure in are useless. And they're witnesses. They do not see and they do not know in order that they may be shamed. Who has formed a god or who has cast an idol to be of no use? Behold, all his companions shall be shamed, and the craftsmen are merely human. Let them all assemble, let them stand, let them be in dread, let them be ashamed altogether. A craftsman of iron uses a cutting tool and makes it in hot coals, and by hammers he forms it. And he makes it by the strength of his arm. Moreover, he becomes hungry and has no strength. He does not eat and becomes weary. A craftsman of wood stretches out a line, he sketches it with a stylus. He makes it with wood cutting knives, and with a compass he sketches it. He makes it according to an image of a man, according to the glory of mankind to dwell in a house. In order to cut for himself cedars, he takes a tree or an oak, and he lets it grow strong for him among the trees of the forest. He plants a fir tree, and rain makes it grow up. Then it will become for people fuel to burn. He takes some of it and becomes warm. Yes, he kindles a fire and bakes bread. Yes, he makes a god and prostrates himself. He makes an idol and bows down to it. Half of it he burns with fire. Over half he eats meat. He roasts a roast and is sated. 
Also he is warm and says, Ah, I am warm. I have seen firelight. The remainder of it he makes to be a god, his idol. He bows down to it and prostrates himself and prays to it and says, Save me, for you are my God. They do not know and they do not discern because their eyes are smeared over, unable to see. Their hearts have no insight, so he does not take it to heart. So, no knowledge, no discernment to say, Half of it I burn in a fire and also bake bread over its coals. I roast meat and eat while the rest I make into an abomination. Shall I prostrate myself before a block of wood? He is pasturing on ashes. A deceived heart has misled him, and he cannot save his life. He does not say, Is there not falsehood in my right hand? Thus far the text. The use of tohu in Isaiah 44, 9 reflects the language of Genesis 1, 2. The word is frequently translated as formless. Joseph Alexander translates tohu as vanity. He writes that it is to be taken as a negative expression of the strongest kind, denoting the absence of all life, intelligence, and power. End quote. August Pieper states that the word is used literally as physical waste and void, and spiritually as vanity, emptiness, and nothingness. R. Reed Lessing translates with the word nothing, noting tohu is the opposite of shalom, or wholeness, peace, well-being. The word suggests both emptiness and disorder. It is admitted that translating tohu as disorder could play into the hands of those who espouse chaos kampf in Genesis 1-2, a primordial battle between Genesis and chaos. However, as Lessing points out, water imagery is never portrayed as Yahweh's enemy. Rather, he uses it as his instrument in creation, Genesis 1, and in redemption, the Exodus event. Now there is some debate as to who the term Edehem, their witnesses, refers to in 44.9. Are the idols their makers' witnesses, or are the idol makers' witnesses of their idols? Lessing understands the witnesses to be the idol makers. John Oswald, a conservative uh, reformed uh, exegete, who translates these words as their witnesses they are, appears to agree, though the translation doesn't make it clear. The confusion comes from pestle, which is idle, being in the singular, and yet here the pronoun and noun are in the plural. The content of the verse, which speaks of shame, would make the translation their witnesses, that is, the idol's witnesses, that is, they do not see, who doesn't see, the idol makers, to be the better choice. Knut Holter remarks, it is surprising to notice that many interpreters take the suffix in Edehem, in other words, hem, as referring to the idols and not the idol fabricators. Referring back to 44.8, Israel is called Yahweh's witnesses. Here the ignorant idol fabricators and idolaters are blind witnesses of their useless idols. Certainly sarcasm is being communicated. Those who should be Yahweh's witnesses are ignorant, blind witnesses of blocks of wood and pieces of metal. It must be noted that the concept of shame is prevalent in this polemic. Yohan Muraaka indicates that the conjunction lima'an in verse 9 expresses purpose, but it can also indicate effect rather than its aim. Walkie O'Connor's references to Eskivitz, who states that lima'an means purpose or intention, but does not communicate the idea of causation. It can also mean on account of. If lima'an is combined with a particle of contingency, it can be translated as so that. However, that's not the case here. Gazenius Couch Cowley indicates the lima'an with the imperfect uh, yoboshu indicates purpose. Edward Young translates it in this manner. Here the idea is that idol fabricators are blinded and ignorant so that they may be put to shame. Their shame then is found in the following verses. The word pestle, idol or image, sometimes graven image, derives from the verb pasal to hew or hew into shape. As in the opening words of 4.9, the words, the formers of idols, point to the absurdity of idolatry because the idol fabricator makes his own god. He fabricates that which he then worships. In verse 10, 
Ale, God, and pestle, idol, are put in the parallel, pointing to the ridiculousness of this as earlier expressed by the word tohu. Idols of iron and idols of wood are both described alike. Their maker's work is understood to be wearisome, foolish, ludicrous. A challenge in translating the first phrase of verse 12 is that it has no verb. A craftsman of iron, a cutting tool. That's all you've got. Both the ESV and the New American Standard understand the words to mean the idle worker shapes his cutting tool in the colt. However, if verse 12 is in parallel with 13, which I believe it is, then the emphasis on what's being shaped or formed is not the tool but the idol. This is consistent with the entire context. Blessing takes it in this manner as well, which makes the most sense. In 44.13, the statement about the use of wood to make an idol, the reader encounters a longer and far more intriguing argument. The emphasis on the use of trees for forming gods may well have its reference the tree of the knowledge of good and of evil. The man and the woman sought wisdom in the tree's fruit rather than in Yahweh. Upon eating it, they covered themselves with plant matter and hid themselves in the midst of the trees, indicating the shame that resulted from trusting the tree as a god, in other words, a source of wisdom, rather than Yahweh Elohim. In Isaiah, the story is amplified. These trees are not those planted by Yahweh, but ones they idolatrously plant themselves, 44.14. Lessing writes that likvah lo, an infinitive construct with a reflexive or ethical lamed and an object noun, is a purpose clause. The reason for growing the tree is to cut it down for use, here both as fuel and as a god. The verses that follow indicate the evil purpose for which the trees were planted. Man plants the tree. He cuts it down. He uses part to make a fire so that he can cook his meal. With the remainder, he fashions an idol. He worships it, a tree, now a block of wood, which he himself has planted and made. The wisdom sought in the tree has made him to be an utter fool. The final jab comes in 44.17, where the idol maker, bowing down to his own creation, cries out, Hatzileni, save me, for you are my God. Isaiah then makes his conclusion about the idol fabricators. They are ignorant without discernment because their eyes are smeared over. They are unable to see the truth. With a return to the singular pronoun, he continues that the man has no knowledge, no discernment to understand, that he's bowing down in worship to a block of wood. Literally, it does not return to his heart that he is involved in foolishness. He therefore cannot say these words, is there not falsehood in my right hand? Context. Having examined the polemic against idols and idol, idol fabricators, it is well to seek the polemic more firmly within the context in which it is found. Isaiah as a prophetic book is rich and variegated. Lessing notes various genres in Isaiah 40 to 55. He indicates five types of oracles in chapter 44 alone. 44, 9 to 20 is an oracle against idolatry or what Frank Mathaus calls Gotzen polemic. Isaiah 44 begins with an oracle of salvation spoken by Yahweh to Jacob, my servant. Verse 5 is a full declaration that Yahweh's people will call upon him as their God. Verses 6 to 8 clearly declare there is no God besides Yahweh. There is no rock I know, not one. Next begins our polemic against idolatry in verses 9 to 20. At the end of this section, Jacob is called to remember these things because the nation is Yahweh's servant. A proclamation of forgiveness and redemption is then made in 44.22. Verse 23 begins a song or oracle of praise, followed by a declaration that Yahweh, Israel's Goel, who made the heavens and the earth, who opposes liars and fools, will raise up Cyrus by name to effect the return from exile. Cyrus is called a shepherd, verse 28, one under Yahweh's direction. The entire chapter functions to point to Yahweh as their sole redeemer, their savior. It will not be by the power of Cyrus's false gods. It cannot be, because the only God there is, is Yahweh. Thus, all idolatry is foolishness, 
Idols are a lie, pure falsehood. Quote, one could call it a satirical track on the folly of manufacturing and worshiping idols. Thus far, amazingly, Von Rod. The function. Within this context, Isaiah 44, 9 to 20 operates. Whether this polemic belongs to the chapter or was added later has been a source of debate among scholars. Matthaus states, and I translate, for most Old Testament researchers, it has stood as a certainty for almost a century that the polemic against idols of 44, 9 to 20 does not belong to the original core of the composition of Isaiah 40 to 55, end quote. An example of this is a 1975 article by Wolfgang M. W. Rolt, in which he writes, on the whole, in a flow, the parodies tend to interrupt the flow of the sections in which they appear. He therefore rejects them as original. Yet, in 1980, in that same journal, Richard Clifford argued that the idle passages portray vivid contrast, essential to preaching, contrast between Yahweh and idol fabricators, between Israel and the nations, between Cyrus and idols. The polemic against the idols is part of the creation faith argument of Isaiah. According to Ben C. Olenberger, the creation texts in the Hebrew Bible are concerned primarily with questions of order, with the nature of that order, its preservation and its quality, including its moral quality, end quote. The disorder, signified by tohu, reflects the issue of creation's proper order and the way idol-making and idol-worship militates against that order. The order does not simply have to do with the past. It is of current import. P.H.B. Harner notes, it is significant in this respect how often to Isaiah links creation faith with the expectation of Yahweh's imminent action in history rather than his deeds in the past. In 44.24-28, it is linked more specifically with Yahweh's imminent redemption of Israel. Even Roth concedes that the Lord's creative redemption is the basic theme. In the idol parodies, man's attempt to make an idol of a topic. So it's puzzling why he would argue that the idol parodies break up the flow of the passage. They seem rather to make a stark contrast, which works well homiletically. The chapter ends with the prophecy of Cyrus called by Yahweh as his servant. Bullenberger notes that the pagan gods are not the power behind the unexpected event of Cyrus. End quote. Yahweh is. Structure. Isaiah 44, 9 to 20 fits well in the polemic of the entire chapter. It also displays its well-crafted structure. In this regard, Matthaus, in his helpful article, shows how the structure of this section supports the overall argument of the chapter and Isaiah 40 to 55. He states, and again I, quote, I translate, the polemic against idols in 44, 9 to 20 displays a well-designed structure, following all the rules of Hebrew poetry arranged in unit, which with different poetical means for existence bifurcations and circular composition, demonstrates the proof of the uselessness of the idols and the human lack of comprehension." End quote. Verse 9 is an Einleitung, an introduction. Within it, both themes of the uselessness of idols and the ignorance of their devotees is presented. Verse 12 and 13 describe the Gotzenbuilder, the idol fabricator, who's mentioned here in the singular. Then, the verses 14 to 17 describe the idol fabricating in the particular under the aspects of worship and salvation. Verse 27 refers back to 9a in the introduction, 18 and 19 back to 9b, describing the idol fabrication under the aspect of knowledge. Verse 18 is in the plural, and finally verse 20 closes the polemic. Schluss, kein Rettung, and kein Erkenntnis, conclusion, no salvation and no knowledge. Matthäus' outline of the section, I think, is very helpful. It takes into account the changes in number. This is noted as well by Knut Holter. Quote, one striking feature of the structure of 44, 9 to 20 is the shift in number from plural to singular and back to plural again. This shift in number happens to coincide to a certain extent with another striking feature, which also concerns its structure, the shift in character from the accusing in 9 to 11 to the describing 12 to 17, and then back to the accusing. Concluding remarks. The polemic against the idols, 
Isaiah 44, 9 to 20, is a well-structured argument that serves the entire chapter well. The prophecy about Cyrus is a word from Yahweh that this pagan ruler would be Yahweh's servant, used to deliver Yahweh's people. It would be important, of the utmost importance, for the people to know that it would not be the pagan gods of Persia that would be the power behind this momentous event. <clears throat> Yahweh is the Almighty God. Idols are nothing. Pagan gods are nothing. They are blocks of wood and cast iron statues. As Israel awaits deliverance from exile, they must know and believe who is their Savior. Therefore, the message of the prophet in Isaiah 40 to 848 includes polemic. The chief object of the prophet's attack is the foreign gods. 44, 9 to 20 is a sustained attack on these gods, utilizing sarcasm and ridicule in an attempt to open the eyes of the people to the truth. Yahweh alone is worthy of their trust. Yahweh stands alone above and beyond all categories of comparison. He is not merely the biggest and the best among many others. He is sui generis. While he is the cause of all creation and redemption, he is the only non-caused being. He is ipsum esse subsistence. There is no rock, bal yadati. I know of none. Thank you. About five minutes for questions. If anyone has a question for Dr. Steele, I think it's important in Isaiah to keep in mind um, that the theme that shows up so often in returning and rest that is your salvation. And so there's a real push in that way for them. And then again, this event of Cyrus coming along, which you hear in the later part they could be thinking in terms of shifting their hope over to another god because of the way that the ancient Near East thought about the gods. Um, and in our culture here, it may not be as strong, but I know on the mission fields and things like that, this looking to other gods and other uh, sources of uh, salvation can be a real temptation. Uh, we just worship our cars and our iPhones. And self. Yes. Self. And self. That's all Twitter is anyway. And one of the classic verses of the Jehovah's Witnesses is, you are my witnesses. Yeah. They get the, it's ironic that they worship a created being. Yeah. yeah. I was thinking of I was thinking of the writing on concerning the old. He asked the question, why did the old plant the trees? And then he answers it so that they won't be remembered. Mm. Yeah. I find it very, you know, it's, to me it's fascinating. I would like to dig this a little deeper. And someday I'd like to preach a sermon on it this way too. But the, uh, the hiding among the trees and the word there for the trees and stuff like that, how that gets used mm -hmm. in the Old Testament, there's more to it than just the fact that they hid in the woods. Mm -hmm. um, they're tr in the, that, that, those trees get used as a stand in for the gods, the false gods in the Old Testament. So there's a lot more to it than just that. Um, kind of like John's prologue, Genesis chapter 1 and 2 are, I think Luther is the one who said, didn't he? It's all there anyway in the first three chapters or so. Um, thinking about something I've heard in the most Google thing that you hear from that people, places, things, events, in not in the United States, but in the world. The most Google thing, you ready for this? World Cup Soccer. Well, that's why we call it the soccer ball. B-A-A-L. I mean, when you do that. <laughs> yes! <laughs> uh, <laughs> 